Hey guys, it's me, Mr. 250, and welcome back to Banshee's Last Cry. Now, we're going to get started with what I'd like to call the Banshee chapter. I spoke a little bit briefly on this before, and I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to let the game explain it. But our starting point here is uh, fairly early in the game. We are actually starting at the face in the window, but I wanted to start here so you could see where we're at a little better. So what happened is that we decided uh, that we wanted to meet up in one of our rooms to spend some time together until dinner. So Max changes, and then Grace comes to our room. Uh, we end up saying, mm, just a little higher, you know, same thing as before. This isn't part of the decision, by the way, just so you know. Uh, I'm just showing you a bit of background information. So she freaks out. She's like, oh my gosh, there's something outside the window. And we couldn't see anything. Now, before we said, you know, kind of jokingly, maybe it's an undercover spy, which gave us our spy chapter. Now, what if we instead decided to say, you know, it's, we didn't say you're probably just seeing things, which I believe if we pick that answer, that sends us back into the murder chapter, the main route, as it were. What if we said instead, yeah, I bet it was a ghost. It was probably just your eyes playing tricks on you. What I really wanted to do was to ask her to continue with the massage, but Grace didn't look like she was in any mood for that. I feel kind of creeped out. Can we go to the lounge? Um, yeah, sure. This is going to be a long night. I think this is very similar to before. Alright, uh, this is going to be very similar. Same thing here. We're just flattering. We're, Grace is like, you're flattering me. We're like, no, I really think you're beautiful. And, and she's like, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Same thing without thinking. I reached out and her hands met. And then we ask her, how do you feel about me? Which makes her super nervous, and she's like, oh my gosh, I kind of like you and stuff. And then we see the guy, and it's like, oh, there's a mafia guy. Oh well, it doesn't matter. You're kidding, right? We can't snowboard in this weather. Most of this is going to be very similar. Okay, so if you remember before, it said, uh, it, the message changed from death at midnight to something along the lines of the Banshee is here, or I, I can't exactly remember, but it was different. Well, at this point, the girls freak out, come in here and say, someone was out the window, they were watching us. The moment we heard that, Grace and I looked at each other. Mr. Force replied with a nervous smile on his face. In this weather? It was probably just a tree branch blowing in the wind. It, it wasn't a branch, it was a person. Throwing her support behind the girl with the glasses, Grace interrupted. I saw him too, Uncle Bill, from Max's room. He said I wasn't, he said I was just imagining things, so I wasn't sure. But now, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Not you too, Grace. You thought it was your imagination, right? Well, it was. He chuckled like it was a big joke, but his eyes weren't laughing. Mr. Forrest was acting strangely. That was clear to me anyway, but the girls didn't seem to have noticed. Still looking disturbed by their experience, the group gave up and went back to their room. But Grace wasn't convinced. How could multiple people see the same illusion at the same time like that? Because you all saw the same thing, I guess. Mr. Forrest answered without meeting her gaze. But Max's room and the girls are on different floors. If something looks like a per that looks like a person can change heights like that, I'd say that's pretty creepy, wouldn't you? Grace, please, keep your voice down. Mr. Forrest scolded her in a harsh whisper. My business relies on word of mouth here. I don't want anyone spreading any silly stories. He came to where Grace and I were on the sofa. Sitting down, so, that, so close that our legs were touching, he began speaking in a low, almost conspiratorial voice. Okay, listen. What I'm going to tell you goes no further than this room. We both swallowed nervously and nodded. Now, first of all, I want you to remember that I'm not saying I believe it, but... Well, once in a while it, it shows up. What does? Grace asked. Something like what you saw. But don't ask me what it is. I've never seen it. A, a ghost? Grace seemed surprised, but Mr. Force neither confirmed nor denied it. 
An eerie silence descended over us. Grace and I searched each other's faces, trying to decide whether or not to laugh. Uncle Bill, are you just trying to scare us with some kind of elaborate trick? I know how you've always been into practical jokes like this. Don't be ridiculous. If it was a joke, I would have just kept it between you two. You think I'm here to scare the wits out of my paying clients? That made sense. Obviously, scaring guests wouldn't be a smart move for somebody in the hospitality business. It was unlikely he'd be willing to risk his in for the sake of a practical joke. So, you're saying they really appear? The ghost, I mean. Here at the end? Mr. Forrest didn't answer. Clearly, he didn't want to admit something as far out as the existence of ghosts. So, we're not the first ones who saw it? Mr. Forrest quietly nodded. How long has this been going on? Our first complaint came the very first winter we were open. Someone claimed they spotted a peeping Tom. At first, we thought it was just some weirdo, so we looked all around the outside for clues. But we couldn't find a single, snow, a single footprint in the snow. I don't know what they saw, but it couldn't have been a person. Was it some kind of animal, maybe? Like a, a bat or a raccoon? Something people aren't used to seeing up close. If it was that, then we'd see him all year, not just in the winter. It never shows up in the other seasons? Not once, Mr. Forrest answered tersely. A midwinter ghost. For some reason, I couldn't get the winter warlock out of my mind, whatever the heck that is. He was a character from a Christmas special I watched every year. Some evil old wizard with a long nose and a dangly cap that only became a good guy after he gave up his magical powers. Strangely, I always liked him better when he was evil. It's funny, the sort of things that pop into your mind when you're stressed about something. Fortunately, Grace was much more rational. Maybe someone with a house nearby has been playing a joke on you. You know, maybe they get their kicks by trying to scare your guests. There aren't any other houses. Not within walking distance. And if they came by car, I would have noticed. Believe me, I've racked my brains trying to think of an explanation. And the only answer I've come up with is... to forget about it. Grace looked like she still wanted to talk about it, but Mr. Forrest stood up to signal the end of the conversation. Just then, we heard the sound of a car approaching. And this is going to be somewhat similar. Alright, well, Mr. Forrest comes in, we, we apparently call him huge and bearded like Paul Bunyan. And, uh says, how long have you guys been in here? We just got in yesterday. Oh, yesterday, huh? Anything interesting happened yet? So we could either say, eh, not really, or, huh? How did you know? I asked, surprised. And this is a new track I don't think has been in the game yet. I might actually, because I do have a bit of time this time, I might actually see if I can find this same track in the, um in the original game and play it for you guys because the original game does have some really interesting tracks so if I remember I will do that as well make a little extra bit uh... so it did huh? he leaned his body in closer uh... well... with Mr. Forrest there I couldn't come right out and say it then as if aware of how close we were to the subject he had just warned me about Mr. Forrest came bustling nervously towards us I'm sorry sir but these guests are pretty tired. If you wouldn't mind not troubling them while they're... Troubling? Ah, we were just having a little conversation. Oh, by the way, excuse me for not introducing myself. Here. He held out his business card for me to take. On it was the title, Jonas Fobbers, Freelance Writer. So you're here researching a piece? Mr. Force seemed taken aback. Y yes, well... I heard some rather interesting rumors. R rumors What kind of rumors? Well, it's really no big deal. Probably just some silly story spread by the local kids, is my guess. W what kind of silly story? Mr. Forrest tried his best to control the tremor in his voice, but unfortunately he failed miserably. But, well, please d don't laugh. I mean, it's really silly, but... People say that a ghost has been spotted in this inn. 
Isn't that ridiculous? If it was, no one was laughing. Mr. Fobbers, seeing her stony faces, seemed to understand immediately what that meant. Hmm. You guys know what I'm talking about, eh? C Canadian, eh? So I, I guess it wasn't so silly after all. Suddenly, Mr. Four started laughing hysterically. Not so silly. So what, you actually believe in ghosts? Well, I don't particularly believe or not believe, but since I've got multiple eyewitnesses claiming they saw it, I was planning to maybe introduce this place as a power spot for the occult. So how about it? You saw something too, didn't you? What did it look like? Grace looked down without saying a word. I'm sure she was trying to cover for her uncle, but it was too late for that. At just that moment, there was a piercing scream. Mr. Fobbers reacted more quickly than the rest of us, immediately running towards the guest rooms. The rest of us followed on his heels. When we got into the hallway, we saw someone silhouetted in front of an open door. It was Mr. Buchanan. Ah, Billy boy, good timing. It's Amber, she... Your wife? What happened to her? Mr. Forrest asked, stepping forward. But instead of answering, Mr. Buchanan just gestured towards the room. Mr. Forrest peeked in, then let out a loud gasp before leaping into the room. We followed after him. Miss Buchanan! Mr. Forrest ran to where she lay on the floor to make sure she was breathing. What happened anyway? Fabers asked Mr. Buchanan. Well, I ain't exactly sure. One minute she was looking out the window. Next thing I know, she's screaming her head off and then BAM! Down she went! Of Course I took a gander out myself, but I didn't see a thing! Grace and I locked eyes. So it is true, Mr. Fobbers murmured to himself. So what's true? What's that supposed to mean, son? Mr. Buchanan sounded angry, but instead of answering, Mr. Fobbers responded with his own questions. Is your wife sensitive to the presence of spirits? Spirits? What the heck you talking about, boy? I mean, does she experience sleep paralysis a lot, or hear sounds that you don't hear? Well, heck, she gets sleep paralysis all the dang time! Especially when we're on vacation. She said she can sense spirits too, but I always figured she just got tired easy. Hmm, it looks like it's pretty clear, Mr. Faber said to Mr. Forrest. What? What the heck is so gosh dang clear? Fobbers took a quick glance at Buchanan, and then answered, Something besides us is here at the end. Is, it was a blast of cold... It was as if a blast of ice-cold air had suddenly frozen us in place. The long silence that followed was finally broken by Mr. Forrest. This is ridiculous. Even Mr. Buchanan said it. His wife just gets tired easily. She gets tired and has daydreams, that's all. I thought it was a little late in the evening for daydreams, but Felty more or less had the right of it. Unfortunately, Mr. Buchanan didn't seem to be on board. Nope. She wasn't daydreaming. She was wide awake. But I'm not so sure what Mr. Forrest was about to say, but he was interrupted by a moaning sound from Amber. <coughs> Amber, honey, you okay? Mr. Buchanan sat her up and shook her gently. Amber opened her eyes and looked around. Oh, sugar pie, I'm sorry, did I pass out? Yep, just for a spell. What exactly did you see? Father asked from where he was standing to the side. Amber covered her mouth with an audible gasp, as if remembering something terrible. Something was out there, outside the window, watching us. These cold eyes, glowing in the dark. She shut her eyes tight and shook her head as if to banish the image from her mind by force of will. What did this thing look like? I couldn't really say. All I could see were the glowing eyes. They were terrifying. You, you couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman? No, I'm sorry. Once again, silence descended on the room. Terrifying eyes glowing in the darkness. What, it, was it even possible that they were human? Did something happen? The three girls were watching from the hallway. Mr. Force ran to them like he was shot from a bow. 
Uh, no, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Miss Buchanan was just feeling a little ill, that's all. It didn't look like the girls were buying... It didn't look like the girls were buying a story, so he more or less shoved them out of the room and closed the door behind them. This is getting interesting, Mr. Fabry said, licking his lips. Interesting? This is no joke! It's gonna ruin me! Mr. Forrest glared at him angrily. Oh, I don't think it's a joke either. In fact, I think this time it might be the real thing. The real thing? You mean a real ghost, don't you? How can a grown man actually... Fobbers raised his hand to interrupt, then turned to the rest of us. Christmas Eve, 20 years ago. Do any of you know what happened here? I saw Mr. Four's face turn as white as a sheet. Who... Who the heck are you? You're the owner of this place, you would know. But what about the rest of you? No ideas? Then let me tell you what I've learned through my research. Don't you listen to him. I wouldn't trust this guy as far as I could throw him. So either, despite what Mr. Force said, I couldn't contain my curiosity, or okay, I won't, I said, sticking my fingers in my ear. Let's go with despite what Mr. Force said. Twenty years ago, what exactly happened? I asked, looking back and forth between Mr. Forrest and Fobbers. It has nothing to do with anything. Come on, Grace, let's go. Wait, I'd like to know too. What Fobbers said next made both Grace and I gasp. I think Grace has every right to ask. After all, she was directly involved. Directly involved? Me? Don't ask him, Grace, Mr. Forrest shouted. But I thought I could sense calculation in his voice. You haven't told her anything? Nothing? That's kind of cruel, isn't it? She doesn't even know what happened to her real parents. Grace looked thunderstruck. R real parents? But I'm... I'm... Uh, Uncle Bill! Is what this guy's saying true? Is it? Answer me! Were my real parents... Cornered by the barrage of questions, Mr. Forrest lowered his eyes and turned away, a painted look on his face. I'm sorry, Grace. I had no choice. Believe me, I had no choice. There was silence for a few moments. Then lowering his voice, Faber continued with the story. Twenty years ago, this place wasn't a little charming inn. It was a charcoal shack. Everything as far as the eye could see was owned by one wealthy landowner and inside the shack lived the family of one of his many workers. The wealthy landowner had three children. The two boys were named Henry and William, and the girl was named Elizabeth. Grace's hand flew to her mouth in shock. Uh, Elizabeth? Y you mean my mother? But my mother and uncle didn't have another brother. Grace's hand flew to her... Wait. Wait. Her hand flew to her mouth in shock, and then it again flew to her mouth in shock. Fabers ignored her and went on. Going against the stern wishes of his parents, the elder son Henry, started dating the beautiful daughter of that couple that lived in the charcoal shack. But when the girl, Shannon was her name, became pregnant, the landowner went mad with rage. Looking over, I saw that all the color drained from Grace's face. So Grace's uncle wasn't the eldest. He had an older brother? But what happened to him? Fabers went on with the story. Even as she approached the final trimester, there was no sign of compromise from the father. So Henry, having been basically disinherited, decided to move into the old shack with Shannon. Then one night, there was a terrible blizzard, the kind of storm that they used to say the Banshee comes out in. Henry's father summoned his son to his house to make one last attempt to convince him to give up on the girl. Of course, he stubbornly refused to abandon the woman he loved. When his father tried to prevent him from leaving, Henry realized his father was acting suspicious. He dashed out of the house and drove as quickly as he could back to the shack. But the sight that awaited him... I heard the sound of someone swallowing nervously. Shannon and her parents lying in a pool of blood. Grace's knees started to buckle, and I quickly moved to hold her up. All their throats were slashed open. They had died nearly instantaneously. But surprisingly, one of them survived. The unborn child in Shannon's womb. 
Ooh, spooky music. <laughs> Fabers gravely planted his eyes on Grace. The child pulled from the dead woman's stomach was named Grace. She was given to the daughter Elizabeth and her husband since they knew that they were unable to have children of their own. I glanced at Grace. She looked at Mr. Forrest. He stared at the floor. A solitary tear formed in Grace's eye and steadily grew until, overflowing, it traced a line down her cheek, finding its lonely way to the floor. I is it true, Uncle Bill? Is that really true? Please tell me! There's more to the story, Grace. The final report concluded that a robber had likely forced his way in and killed the victims when he was spotted. But not only were there no valuables or money in the place, it's highly unlikely that a thief would be interested in breaking into an old shack on the night of one of the worst blizzards in years. Rumors began to circulate that someone had made threats and paid a lot of bribe money to make the case disappear. Would that have been Grace's grandfather, the rich landowner? I looked over at her to confirm it, but she appeared to be deep in thought. So this Henry, what happened to him? Fabrice appeared to hesitate for a moment before making up his mind. The day after his wife's funeral, he was found in the nearby woods hanging by his neck, dead. Grace suddenly squeezed my hand so hard that I could feel the bones grinding against each other. I gritted my teeth and endured the pain. It was nothing compared to what I knew she was feeling at the moment. I stole a glance at her. Her eyes were strangely blank like some kind of protective veil had covered them to shield her from the unbearable truth she had just heard. I realized that the real shock and grief was only going to come later. Mr. Forrest's eyes stabbed furiously into Fabers, and, as he spoke, his voice quivered with a rage I hadn't suspected him capable of. You, look, who the heck do you think you are? Coming in here calling yourself some kind of a cult rider? I bet you're just gonna snap some photos and sell them off to some tabloid mag. I know you're kind. I hope you enjoyed ripping apart this lady's heart for a quick buck, you jerk. Now get out of my inn. Mr. Force, you know I can't go anywhere in this storm. Besides, I really am here to research a story on the supernatural, and I've only just started. You know, I have ambitions for success just like anyone else. If I can get to the bottom of an unsolved murder from 20 years ago, then sure it might get a lot of media attention. But more important than that, it'll be doing a public service, don't you think? The two glared at each other, waiting to see who would back down first. But before either of them budged, Grace shook off my hand and ran out of the room. A Grace! On the other side of the door, the three girls were all gathered together, apparently never having returned to their room. I got ready to burst through them like a linebacker on a full blitz. But before I did, I had one last thing to say to Faberge. Couldn't you... Couldn't you have considered her feelings a little more? Don't you care about how much damage you've done? I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I took off running after Grace. I saw her disappear into her own room, so I went and tried to open the door, but it was locked. I knocked hard and called her name. Grace! Grace! I know you're in there! Let me in! Leave me alone! Her voice sounded unexpectedly cold. But Grace... I'm fine. I, I just want to be alone. So, let's see. I decided I should respect her feelings, so I quietly left. When I turned around, I saw that it wasn't just the three girls, but Mr. Forrest, Mr. Fabers, and the two Buchanans all staring at me together. I didn't feel like talking to any of them, so I resolutely headed back to my own room. Before leaving, I called out to Grace through the door. I'll be in my room. Come by any time if you feel like talking, okay? I'm sure she must have heard me, but there was no response. I walked des... Pond That's a big word. Feeling or showing extreme discouragement. So, despondently. Yeah, that's how you say it. I walked despondently back to my room, avoiding the gazes of the others. Lying on the bed... I ran the whole sordid story we had just heard over in my mind. Not only had Grace found out her real parents weren't who she thought, but right after that, she was told that they both suffered gruesome deaths. And to top it all off, it may have been her grandfather that was behind their murders. 
I couldn't even begin to imagine what kind of pain and shock Grace was going through at that moment. Filled with an overwhelming feeling of powerlessness, I got up off the bed and paced back and forth in my room. I want to be with her, I thought. But no, I should just let her have some time alone. But still, I don't know how much time passed while I debated with myself what to do. Ooh. That sounds like a good spot to stop, don't you think? Yeah. So this chapter uh, isn't going to take as long, I think. In fact, we've only got about four more decisions in this route before we hit the end. And then we're going to have another route that branches off this. There's only two routes in this. that uh, Or two endings, I should say. Is going to have another one that branches off of this, I think. And we'll do that. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you guys for probably the ending next time, and maybe you might even be able to wrap up the whole Banshee chapter next time. It's, uh, it's definitely an interesting one. It, it's a quick one, though, from what I know. Although, well, the next one might be a bit long. I don't know. Regardless, we'll come back next time, and we will find out. Thanks for watching. Bye! Hey guys, me, Mr. 250, back for a little bit of end of video stuff here. So, one thing that I had said was that, you know, I was going to show you guys that music track. And as shown in uh, my edit, you know, I couldn't exactly find the track. Because the closest thing I've got to an OST right now is there's one video on YouTube called Kamatachi no Yoru. Um, then it has some Japanese hiragana and then followed by full soundtrack. Which, it, it's a little bit confusing to navigate, but it's the best thing I've got to work with right now. So I figured, uh, and I, I don't want to look all these tracks up in my actual game, because, like I said, this is the closest thing I have to a soundtrack. There are a few a random assorted videos on YouTube, but for the most part, this is the best thing I have. But I thought I'd show you guys some tracks that uh, you may, in fact, remember from uh, throughout the story. Just some of my more favorite ones, and we may do some more of these later if uh, people like this. But uh, the first one is, this is one that happens, I think... Whenever you get one of those, you know, really bad ends when you die, such as, I believe the first end we had actually had this, where, when you get stabbed by Grace, but this music right here, this is the version that is in the, uh, in the original Super Famicom version. Now, next is a piece that I actually really like. This one is one of those pieces that it doesn't have a whole lot going on because it's, you know, it's very simple and it's very obviously background music. It does not really take the foreground in any real meaningful way. However, when listened to at night like I am right now and, you know, just with the feeling of the game, it actually is quite a spooky track. And uh, I thought you guys would might like to hear the original version. I really do like that one. That one is a really good one, in my opinion. Now, we're going to move on to another one. Now, there was a couple things you may have noticed throughout the story, such as that Max is not always the brightest individual, and sometimes he will go and, you know, just kind of guess at that, wait, it must have been Amber, or it must have been the three girls. I'm talking about the original story, of course. And, you know... The scary thing about that is, like, we've been sitting with them the whole time, and they seem so innocent, and yet, could they have been the murderer? This is usually the music that plays during that time, and it's some it's another one of these pieces that I really think helps fill the mood much better than any dialogue could ever do, honestly.
Now here's a nice piece here that uh, obviously isn't quite as scary as the rest of the pieces. This plays whenever you get into, you know, a fight with the killer as it would be. And uh, we normally don't hear a whole lot of this, honestly, because most of the main route is pretty spooky throughout the whole thing. So you don't hear this a lot. But you do hear this occasionally, and this one's a fun one. Just it, It's fun, but it, it isn't particularly outstanding, I'd have to say. But when compared to the original version, it's also, you know, it, you can tell it's simple, but it does have a very interesting base to it. Alright, now another track. This one we actually did here today, and uh, I might I might add a, I might add just a little bit into it, uh, boost it a bit louder than was in the actual video because you know I needed to talk over it. But this is what the original or this is what the track sounds like in our version. And now. I'm going to edit in what the track sounded like in the Super Famicom version. Obviously very similar, but as you may notice, and I honestly think the Super Famicom version's a little bit creepier in this situation, this is a very, like, kind of metallic, very industrial, kind of creepy sound, and it's... it wouldn't be out of place in a sci-fi horror game, let's just say that. And I thought we'd finish off today's track with uh, something a little happier, because I've been doing a lot of kind of creepy, sad songs. And keep in mind, this isn't the entire OST. Um, if you want to look it up, I'm going to try to leave a link in the in the, uh, in the the description. But if I forget, it is called, uh, the video is called, Kama, Kama Itachi no Yoru. Just, you could just search Banshee's Last Cry OST. That's what I usually do on YouTube. And it leads me to uh, the video clips you've been seeing. Uh, this isn't mine, obviously. It's from the game, so please don't get me for copyright stuff. But there are, I would guesstimate, at about 25 songs in here, I think. And it's actually pretty good. Uh, but these are just a collection of some of the ones that I think are kind of interesting. And I may do this, in fact, later and go over a few more. There's a few more tracks I think we haven't gone over yet. Um, in the game, so I'm withholding going over those yet. But for now, I'm going to leave you with this last one. This is one that kind of plays usually whenever Max is kind of thinking about stuff. Uh, you know, usually near the end is what usually happens. He's usually like, he, this is his final thoughts before he dies kind of thing is generally how this comes out. Um, so it's another interesting track, and I hope you guys like it. And that's where I'm going to leave you off for today. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time for more Banshee's Last Cry. Bye!